Samos Jewish Family and Children's Service, in cooperation with Cooper University Hospital, present a Family Health Podcast. In this program, Parenting Styles in the Modern Era, Different Approaches for Dealing with the Facebook Generation, with Dr. Richard Selznick, Director of the Cooper Learning Center. At the lectern is Lydia Silpe, Grant and Outreach Coordinator of Samos Jewish Family and Children's Service, to introduce the program. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming out on Sunday, a gross day outside. I'm glad you are all here. My name is Lydia Silpe. I'm from Jewish Family and Children's Service. I'm the Grant and Outreach Coordinator, and in that capacity, I guess this is outreach. Uh, we're bringing you this program as part of the Cooper University Hospital Jewish Family and Children's Service Partnership. It's one of a series of six free family seminars that we have, we've hosted two. This is our third, and we'll be hosting three more. Um, Steve Lebetkin is our videographer, podcaster, etc. So I wanted to let everyone here know that this presentation will be podcasted and video taped. So if you don't want yourself identified, either a picture of you or what you say, just let us know and we'll be sure to uh, block that out. But people do come to our website and they listen to our program, so it's, it's an important uh, resource that they have. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Richard Selznick. He is the director of the Cooper Learning Center. He's a licensed psychologist, nationally certified school psychologist, assistant professor of pediatrics, and graduate school professor. Dr. Selznick has more than 25 years of experience in the field of reading and learning disabilities. He's a nationally recognized speaker on learning disabilities and the author of the internationally recognized book, The Shutdown Learner, Helping Your Academically Discouraged Child. I will tell you that on that table, there are uh, copies of his books for his signing. There are materials about Cooper University Hospital, as well as Jewish Family and Children's Service in the back. Refreshments. Thank you again. We have uh, parenting styles in the modern sort of Facebook era. Is it, are they new challenges, or is it, as uh, David Byrne of Talking Heads fame said, same as it ever was? Is it the same as it ever was? Um, and that's the question of today. That's what I'm going to be putting out there. We have a, we have a range of uh, you know, ages here. We have different concerns, I'm sure, of you know, your own children. A um, couple, couple ground rules. It's Sunday afternoon. It's 2 o'clock. Don't get upset. If I say anything that gets you a little bit off, like, oh, my God, he said, raise your hand. It's go there's going to be a lot of back and forth. I've had people, some, every once in a while, I'll say, like, a controversial thing in a workshop, and somebody will get all upset. And I'm like, oh, my God, I didn't mean to get you. So I'm very willing to entertain, you know, the other point of view. What I present, I'm not saying I'm even right. I'm just giving you a perspective. I'm just kind of like, from my experience, here's the view. And I really, and my wife is here, she could tell you that I'm wrong most of the time. So, you know, right, Gail? So, right, so a good 95% of the time I'm wrong. So I'm sure that what I say to you today, I'll be wrong. So, you know. Um, also, rule number two, this is not group therapy, gang. We are not here to fix your children's problems. It's not, my kid, this, you know, I get, I get that a lot, you know, in these seminars, and it always takes it all off. However, we could open this up, make it very back and forth, and ask generic kind of questions. What, 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 what's your opinion of this situation, that situation? But just watch this. Also, no school bashing. We're not here to bash schools today, so we're going to keep that out of it. Um, so th this is really just the intersection of parenting and the current generation, you know, like, you know, our, our concerns. And I'm, I'm going to start with, as I was reflecting on, on this topic, I, I, this is what came to me. And I think we could start the, the band going, and here's the slide that will help you. I think that we got, we got trouble. 
You know, music man, remember? We got trouble in River City with a capital T that rhymes with P that stands for Pope. Only now it's, you know, we got trouble in Cherry Hill City here. You know, it starts with F and rhymes with Facebook, and I don't know how to rhyme it. And we got trouble with, with cell phones and, and, you know, internet, you know. And as I was reflecting on this, and the whole, you know, I remember the town in Music Man, of course, it was made in the early 60s, but it's reflecting what, what time period, like 1915, I think, when new technology was coming in, you know, telephone and electricity and changes were happening. And, um, you know, the town and the people, right, were all very, very concerned about the changes and the effect that it was going to have on their youth. Correct? Isn't that what that whole theme was in the movie? Am I right? And, you know, I think that it's the same kind of idea. Now, how many of you feel a sense of anxiety relative to these? I know Josh, this, we talked about it already today. You, Gail, my wife feels anxiety about everything, so I can't, that doesn't count, Gail. No, I'm just, just kidding, just kidding. Uh, no, but I, and we feel anxiety about about modern culture, about youth, about where things are heading. I think that we have a sense of things are kind of going to hell in a handbasket, correct? Do we, how many people kind of have that perspective? A little bit. We have a little, it's, it, 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 it nags at us, doesn't it? There's a little bit of that nagging sense that this generation is like, oh man, it's just falling apart and this Facebook stuff and the cell phone and the texting and it's just, right? I mean, so, and, and, and I think it's embodied in, in this kind of, uh, you know, a quote. A decaying age with young people out of control. We live in a decaying age. Young people no longer respect their parents. They're rude and impatient. They frequently inhabit places they shouldn't and have no self-control. It sounds very scary. That's been said in many times because I know in our generation, Parents said that we watch too much TV, and maybe it's it, 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 perhaps exponentially yeah. more distractions, and maybe you'll cover that. Better. Well, I, I certainly will cover, and I think that what's interesting about this quote, uh, 8,000 years ago was written and found on an Egyptian tomb uh, or pyramid. It might not be the exact words, but it's pretty close. I'll give you a couple more quotes. Here's. Socrates, our youth now love luxury. They have bad manners, contempt for authority. They show disrespect for their elders and love chatter in place of exercise. They no longer rise when elders enter the room. They contradict their parents, chatter before company, gobble up their food, and tyrannize their teachers. That was Plato followed Socrates, right? He was a student, right? Then we have Plato checking in on this. What is happening to our young people? They disrespect their elders. They disobey their parents. They ignore the law. They riot in the streets inflamed with wild notions. Their morals are decaying. What is to become of them? See, it's at this point that somebody in the audience is getting upset. Yeah, he's not taking Facebook seriously. You know, don't get upset. Stay calm. That's the message of today. Stay calm. Don't get upset, Lise. It's just like every week we're worried about this generation. And that goes back to, the, to David Byrne talking heads and same as it ever was. And that's kind of the theme. Now, I'm not, again, I'm looking forward later as we develop this to healthy disagreement. Because I'm not even sure if it's necessarily same as it ever was, but I believe that it may be. The young people of today think nothing of nothing but themselves. They have no reverence for parents or old age. They are impatient of all restraint. As for the girls, they are forward, immodest, and unladylike in speech, behavior, and dress. Now, that was, that was more modern. That was Peter the Hermit in A.D. 12, 1243, I think. So that was a more modern quote, gang. But really, the one that, you know, kind of gets us more moving in the right direction, of course, is Alfred E. Newman, 
who made fun of all everything. And Mad Magazine makes fun of everything, so why not get them to kind of check in on this? You know, I think that's a funny line. <laughs> you know, children are natural mimics. They act like, I don't have this in front of me, they act like their parents in spite of every attempt to teach them good manners. So the message, takeaway message number one, gang, takeaway message number one, which from Peter the Hermit and Socrates and Plato and Alfred E. Newman, putting him in the good company of Socrates and Alfred E. Newman, is calm down. Everybody, it's a lot of this, a lot, not all, but a significant percentage of what we're seeing is just the same old story of the elders, sorry to say, we're the elders in the room, Worrying about, I feel it now, the, every day, I'm like, they're not saying hello properly, they're, blah, 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 they're, they're driving too fast. I mean, I'm like, I'm becoming, like, every day, I can't believe how elder, my wife said today, you're becoming one of those old men. And the, we're in the White Wegmans parking lot, she said, you're becoming one of them. And I'm like, oh. And I think that this, as a society, we're, we're a little bit getting there. It's, so, so do we have trouble? Here's the question. There's David Byrne, there's from the video that some of you may remember. Same as it ever was. Remember that one? That was that is when MTV really had videos. No longer just the Snooky show or whatever they have going on here on MTV. But this was a great video. Same as it ever was. You know, it's easy to lose perspective. A couple of weeks ago, my son was home. He's 20. Well, he's soon to be 20. So he's a young man, right? I mean, most of us remember being 20, I think. We remember, I think. It's a long time ago for a lot of but. I said to him in my usual, in my parent anxiety, you know, that wet dog thing that we do with our kids. Daniel, why did you text me when you arrived? Why did you text me? He says, just exactly like this. He said, Dad, did you do that with your parents? Did you do that? And I was like, no. He's like, so what's up? That, that, and I joked with him today in texting. We were texting each other. He said, what are you, I said, what are you doing today? He's watching basketball. I said, I said, I'm going to be quoting you, Daniel. He said, oh, yeah, what? And I, and I said, the quote. He said, well, when did I say that? I said, a few weeks ago when I was badgering you about texting me when you arrived at the party or whatever. And he's like, yeah, I schooled you, didn't I, to me? He said, I schooled you. And I was like, yeah, you did. You know? We forget we weren't texting our parents. We forget we were going places. Here's another, as I was thinking about this topic, I was also remembering when I was, I was 22, 23, my, old, my daughter's age, and I was in 72nd and Broadway in Manhattan and managing the athlete's foot store in the summertime. And uh, I closed the gate around 9 o'clock, it was in the summer, click. And literally, I mean, I thought that I caused this. I clicked the, the lock, and the lights in the city went out. Boom. I caused the blackout of New York City. The blackout occurred. I clicked the, clicked the lock, and, and everything went dark. I'm not exaggerating even a little bit. So what do you do? Well, my friend Stanley, who owned the store, comes down in his car, and we start driving around looking for the rioting and the looting and the fires in the streets. We're just watching everything going on. It's the New York City blackout. And then we see the lights over in New Jersey. And we said, you know, at some point a few hours later, we're getting bored watching the looting here. Let's go to a diner over there. My point is, my parents were on Staten Island. They had lights. They're probably, oh, well, I don't know where Richard is. There's a blackout. He's not being, we're not, they didn't know what texting was. We didn't have it back then. I get back the next morning. Oh, hi, how was the blackout? They weren't driven by all this anxiety that we experience. So it's like, you know, it's a lot of it. Anybody want to comment? I sense a little comment. Michael Geyer, go ahead. I should have, I should, can I use your name there? We have to play that. <laughs> Go ahead. But my parents knew everybody I was friendly with until I went away to school because they would call the home phone and they would either say hello to them and talk to them, but they knew who I was hanging out with. Today, I, you, other, unless you go on to your kids' cell phone records, which I don't 
at the time, or I don't think I even had to do it. You don't really know who they're talking to. I think one of the oddest changes that's happened for me, and I don't know if I could, one of the oddest, piggybacking what, you, what Michael just said, one of the oddest changes for me is that we've gone through effectively eight years of high school, you know, four years of one child, four years in another. And in, within those eight years, you remember how when you used to call, like when you were in high school, you'd be calling your friends' houses all the time. Oh, hi, Richard. How are you? You know, that kind of interaction that you'd have. How are you doing? How are you folks? I don't know. I think the phone rang maybe four times in eight years. Because they bypass the middleman and go straight to the cell phone. So I, I think that that's piggybacking on what you just said. I mean, I think that we, there is a change there. Now, you know, there probably were changes in previous generations, too, that we are losing perspective with. Yeah. Well, there's also this story that, that I remember you telling, or actually your grandmother telling, about how she used to put your, your father, when he was eight years old, with a packed lunch to go to the polo grounds to watch baseball games. Who, who would put an eight-year-old child on the subway with, with a brown paper bag lunch these days? And is it because we're just too nervous? Or I'm not sure it is the same as it ever was. We don't, we're not that trusting of what goes on. We would not do that with a child. We would be held to be criminally negligent if something happened. So I told you that I was willing to be wrong. No, I'm just joking. That, yeah, I mean, I think it, it, this is a hard, these, this is a hard topic. I mean, I like to make light of it a little bit to kind of get us to calm down a little bit, to reduce our parental anxiety some, because I do sense that it's a little too high. That's my big message, I think. Are there reasons to be a bit anxious? Is it an odder thing that, that your kid is now public on a, you know, on a Facebook site? And, and another oddity is that photos that used to reside in our photo album like, oh, I'll go on your Facebook site, click them down, and now they're on my hard drive. I mean, that's a little bizarre that I can have pictures of your bar bat mitzvahs on my, on my hard drive, but I can. I don't know if it's an anxiety thing, and I don't know if you're going to address this, but one thing I just um, hit me the other day, because it was, it was a book review I was reading, forgive me, I can't remember the, the book and the author, but it was talking about how we've increasingly become, or and particularly our, uh, our children have become increasingly digitally connected, and therefore using less verbal. It's interesting that you a couple times mentioned cell phone. Uh, I personally am seeing less and less of that usage with my one child who's here in the U.S., and it's more texting, to the point that this author uh, referenced where she came to someone's house or apartment, and the 21-year-old roommate said, oh, no, no, I'm not going to go knock on her door. I'll text and see if she's available. 15 feet away. And in effect, the, 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 the contention is, and again, I don't know if you're going to talk to this, and it's, to me it's not so much an anxiety thing, but how we're, they're changing, or things are changing so quickly, they're becoming, in effect, more connected and less connected, and in effect, more apart all at the same time. It's great. It's a great comment. I'm sure we will weave it in as we go, and I, and I have lots of concerns and observations about it, too. And again, it, what part of it is the elder brain kind of going, oh, you know how these kids are, and what part is real? An example. As we use these technologies, I believe that there is less human interaction. That's my opinion. I don't know if I'm right. So part of the intelligence test when you assess kids is to ask them what the word um, compassion means and um, re not regret. Uh, the, what's in <laughs> I'm blocking on the remorse. What remorse and compassion, se separate items. And I find over, it's like a sample. I, I wait for them to fump for around and go, Compassion. They know it's a po compassion's a positive emotion, but they can't really explain it, and they kind of can't explain remorse very well. And I just have a theory that maybe we're losing a little bit of that the human emotion piece as we do these texting kinds of things. But again, what part of the brain? Today I texted my son. We didn't talk, good, bad, but when I was in college, I didn't talk to my parents for a week or two. I had more contact with him today on cell phone texting than I did with my parents. It's a, I don't know. We had a nice little con conversation. He was happy not to talk to me. I didn't ask him annoying questions other than what are you doing today. He was happy. Um, we have 13-year-old twins, one boy, one girl. And um, 
I had re I don't know if I read it somewhere that that kids, younger teenagers, whatever, they don't develop judgment until a certain point. And I don't know if you can speak to that or not. That there's a certain amount of judgment that we have to provide for them because they just there's I don't know if there's a certain part of the brain that doesn't develop until a certain age. And again, I don't know if this is a myth or reality that you that they would do something really stupid but not realize that it was stupid because there's a certain part of brain development that's just not there. Is that real or am I just very making real. that up? And it's, it's very real. And they talk about frontal lobe. I'm not a neuropsychologist or a neurologist, but they talk about frontal lobe development. Frontal lobe development is, in a sense, your steering mechanism, your orchestra leader, that part of you that's saying, hmm, let me think this through a little bit. Let me assess the consequences. Now, for some people, they get it pretty early on. A lot of girls, earlier than the boys, that's where maturity kicks in. The girls are thinking it through. I, joked, I used to joke, and I'm not that much of a joke, that my daughter Julia could kind of set up house, meaning like run her life a lot better at 15 than I think I can at this. You know, she just knows how to kind of take care of herself. And it's tied into what you're talking about. There are people who also have later executive function development and I went to a conference that stunned me not too long ago. They said, often it does not develop until into your 20s. So let's th keep that in mind as we go through this a little bit because it's a really, really important point. You know, it's a, and it's an important point in terms of how we approach this problem, which I will get to, believe it or not. <laughs> We're still just kind of laying out the foundation here, a little bit of laying out the groundwork, okay? But it's great points. Um, I do want to ask this question. If you have, let's assume that it is anxiety. Let's assume that this part of what we're talking about is anxiety underneath. And I said to you, you know, the old deal with the devil you'd willing to be willing to make. You know, we all have this kind of worry about Facebook, about so. How many of you, if I said I'm going to make a deal with you, your kid's not going to go on cell phone anymore. You know, they're not going to have worry about texting. You're going to take that off your anxiety plate, but. You have to go back to landline uses now. You have to give up your cell phone, and you're going to be using dial phone and landline phones. How many, hands up, how many would be really willing to do that now? I, no, not really. How about Facebook? Now, Facebook, I'll, I predict I'll get more hands up because, for one reason, because a lot of us don't get it. Same thing with Twitter. You can join that. You can go on at Dr. Sells, by the way, on Twitter if you'd like. So that's a plug. I'm just kidding. Uh, but, and shut down learners on Facebook. Feel free to join it. Um, but a lot of us don't. How many people would be willing to give up Facebook? Yeah, because we don't. As adults, it doesn't hit us that much. We're, but if I, hands up, how many would be willing to give up internet? No. Yeah. Now we're in now we're in scary territory. Can't log on in the morning. You know. Um, we love our technology, and we have to admit that. And we have to be a little careful. I think about our own sort of mixed message on this, you know. You know, I, my wife's here to give me counterbalance, you know, the evil eye. You know, you can't text during dinner now, you know, right, Mr. Geyer? You can't be texting while the lecture's going on, right? I mean, it's, you know, I mean, you know, so, so it's a little bit of a mixed message that we have to worry about. He's one of my, my dear friends, and I'm, I'm willing to tweak him as much as I, I can. So, Here are a few fun facts that, that uh, you know, we could chew on a little bit. Children, this, this, this is the part of the portion of the show where we get ourselves back into being more anxious again. This is where I bring you, it's, like it's kind of like a wave. I use that example. It's like a sine wave. I get you out of the anxiety, I put you back in the anxiety. So this is back in it, okay? Children age 8 to 18 spend up to 7.5 hours a day on some type of electronic activity. Could be game, Xbox, my son used to be really into Xbox 360 Live. It could be your little droid, it could be whatever. TV, TV anything electronic. TV, computer, your, your iPhone, smart board. Smart bo well, I wouldn't put smart board in. Let's take, let's take smart board, you know, in school off of the plate. But I think anything that they voluntarily go to, I think that's a lot of, lot of hours. Any, anybody want to speak on that? 
Mr. Geyer? I don't know what to do because... Great, uh, hold on, get that microphone. My, just, just wait one second when the microphone comes around when you raise your hand. Go ahead. My sixth grade boy will go on Xbox any time he has a minute, but he's doing it with all his friends. And it's their social world, I guess. Right. Uh, right. That was a del- it, it, their it's, social it's, world is... And my wife and I had this dilemma when our, we didn't have it with our daughter. My daughter has probably spent one minute on Xbox 360 Live in her life. Never played video games, ever. So how do you, how but do we... she's certainly been on Facebook for a lot part of her life. <laughs> oh, you think it's easier to control, huh? Hmm. Okay. Well, ho- ho- that's nice. How old are the kids? He's in eighth grade. Eighth grade. Good. Start early. That's a, it's one of the things to talk about. Start early, setting the boundaries, setting the rules, which I like. I like that. So start early, set the boundaries, be clear, we'll, which we'll get to parenting styles, I promise. Point two. And uh, my, Michael's point is a very important one. This is, this is their medium. It used to bother me deeply because I'm a New York City kid. We played in the street. Most of you probably played outside. I was outside for eight hours, nine hours of pop. My mother gave me a lousy bologna sandwich, go back outside, and who wanted to see my mother or father for any part of the day? We were outside. These kids, their medium is... Okay, again, there's that brain switch. Elders, you know, we got trouble with a capital T that rhymes, sounds like Xbox, it rhymes with who knows what. Um, next point, online time among young people increased 40%. In five years, let's say in the last five years, they had a stat that increased a lot. Point three, I like this one. Only 20, I don't know, I like it, it's an interesting one, that's what I meant. Only 27% of the seventh through, that should be 11th graders surveys, said family has established rules on cell phone use. Go back to Lydia's you know, point about establishing rules. And this we have to do a little soul searching and our own comfort or discomfort with rule establishment, you know? And that ties into this parenting styles thing that we're gonna get to in a a couple minutes. But how many of us have established rules about cell phone use? Texting, taking photos, sending photos, all of that kind of stuff. Just ask yourself that question. The next point being relatively few, say parents establish rules about texting. We didn't. I know we didn't in our house. We didn't really establish rules about it. Yeah, we might peck her and nag and bother and badger. That's not establishing rules. 44% have lied about their age online. That's a scary one. Now, I don't exactly, these, these are surveys, you know, I don't, they, they just, you know, you can go on the internet and find these things that get you depressed and get you anxious and worried and all that other stuff. But that's, you know, 67, I like, again, I don't like this one. This one is, just, to me, this was a scary, a scary one. 67% have cleaned their browser history or cache to make sure parents don't see what they are doing online. Oh, clean it up, boom, move on. Um, you know, they know, as a general, th- I went to a workshop not too long ago, they said no matter how technological, except for maybe Steve Lubeckin, of course, no matter how, how technologically savvy you are in the room, maybe it, I don't know, they got you beat. And they said, you know, go down to the youngest parent in the room, they've got you beat in terms of their navigating the universe. They, you, we think Facebook, they already have 10 other places to kind of go on for social media that we haven't even heard of yet. Over 1,000 girls age 14 to 17, 85% have talked to parents about social networking behavior, but half admit they aren't as careful as they should be. Because they talk about it, but they're not doing that much, maybe. Just to bring it back to the normal side, I was reflecting on uh, this. We're worried about it being out of balance, right? That's part of it, out of balance. That's the thing. It's an out of balance, a texting. And then I was saying, boy, I remember spending probably five, six hours a night, a day, staring at album covers. (laughs) How much did Rolling Stone's Let It Bleed change? But I kept staring at it. I don't know, sticky fingers, it kept, no, let me look at this Dylan album, let me read the liner notes one more time, like I was studying the Talmud. I mean, come on. 
I mean, that was really not a productive use of time. So let's, if you read, I would hate to have myself on video in terms of my productive balance between the ages of 12 to 16. That's, again, remember, yeah, it's all out of balance. It's all out of balance. Oh, okay. Richard's in the basement for hours on end. The White Album is still white. And it wasn't drugs, gang. It was just staring at it. I don't know. Wow, look at that white album. Still white. Questions or comments before we move into parenting style? I try as much as I'm very easy to get anxious over things, but I keep trying to remind myself this is just this generation's version of it and to try to say what's the chances of this becoming something so horrible an outcome and it helps, but not 100%. <laughs> no, and that's, look, go back to Music Man, seriously. I'm sure that there was some valid point about the decaying morals, uh, the pool table coming in and smoking and chewing gum that they joke about in the song, that things were, were deteriorating, and we worry about it as we look at the next generation. Point being, we've been worrying about it for about 8,000 years. And there's a, the, I got that website, I got some of those quotes off of a website that says something like 8,000 years of anxiety. That's like the website. You can put that into Google and see where those quotes came from. 8,000 years of anxiety. Well, no, it kind of, I don't know. The thing that, that, that I really struggle with is has the envelope. I mean, I know that, you know, people in our generation, we all lived through 1968, the summer of love. Our skirts were too short to sit down in. We listened to rock and roll that our parents thought was criminal. And I appreciate that, but sometimes I think when I look at some of the, like lyrics in, in songs today, and some of the stuff in movies today, and what's on cable today, I think, is it possible that maybe the envelope just got pushed too far? You and I were watching a show last night that I was like, really? <laughs> Really? You want to know, you know what show I mean, about? I listen to, you know, I mean, it, are, are lyrics today, are they just an extension of know. let's spend the night together? Or is it like, we used to have this conversation about Eminem lyrics all the time. Has it just gone too, is, is it so far out that it's like, wow. Like, I don't know. Right, doesn't numb I, them. That's exactly right. Are they numb? And I, that's what I worry about. And I think a lot of the behaviors are the same. They're just carried out in a different way. And the consequences are greater because they're more publicized. And so if, for example, when I was growing up, if someone you know, said a curse or spoke poorly or dressed poorly, it was just those in the immediate area who may have heard about it or anyone whose parents could call. Now, within a split second, thousands know about it. Thousands see it. And so it just has the potential of becoming so much bigger and so much more significant. Also, online, is, it's a different experience. It's less personal. So just as there was a positive side on the way of um, when people meet through dating at a distance, they feel they know each other. Maybe they're less afraid to open up. The implications in the Facebook world might be that kids may engage in what we might think as riskier behavior, whether it's their frontal lobe or whether it's just, it just doesn't seem as, as big a deal. And then my question when you discuss the parenting style, if you can address it, are there a range of best practices of things that include at what age do you let kids go on as a range, do you become their friends, how do you monitor, whatever's appropriate without seeming like a fuddy-duddy. Thanks. How, I just want to make sure, because I don't, I don't want to, I don't, I'm very comfortable with this, I think the conversation is great, questions are great, commentary is wonderful, I just want to make sure we're okay with time, we're not, we're okay, we're not, there's no, we're good. Okay, fine. All right, good. All right. I actually um, think things did go viral very quickly when I was uh, growing up. Um, we used to um, uh, party at Mark Cook's house and maybe there were 10 people there at 7 o'clock and by 9 o'clock there were 100 people there. Where was and that's invited? And that spread uh, probably within a half hour. Um, so, I mean, I think technology speeds things up, but we could find things out very quickly as kids, you know, where the action was. Because my son last night was saying that, you know, there are these hookup parties or makeout parties or whatever, and, you know, people show up in the, in the dozens. Well, it's no different. 
And just because you can text somebody and say there's a party at somebody's house and people are there, and it, we did it then too. So things did go viral. They go viral differently, but they did go viral. I know we could, I know we could, it's a, I, I love the conversation because it, there isn't an absolute answer, but you know, you can see these, all these perspectives. I do think now let's shift a little bit. This is moving us into the segment where you kind of have, all right, what do I do? How do I handle this? What is my approach? And I think it's tied into, this is my theory, that it's tied into these styles. Now, I love this cartoon. It's wonderful. I'm going to just step away for one second, if that's OK. Um, if I, is that OK, Steve? If I, no. um, just you know, the first one, the, the authoritarian one, you know, it's summed up. <laughs> this, my whole uh, lecture is like tied into you know this five-panel cartoon. <laughs> so the first one says, you know, author authoritarian, do as I say. Authoritative, hey kid, do as I say, okay? <laughs> the next one, permissive, whatever you say. Uninvolved, there's no parent in the panel. <laughs> And then the last one is this evil cyborg. I don't quite get it. It's, uh, it's, or it's just, you know, you're, you know, I think it even says misbehavior alert, destroy child, you know, kind of thing. So anyway, I do think that the answer is tied into this. Okay, let's move into the, now think about these styles because what, where you get stuck with this is thinking, oh, I can't be this style when you may be taking it to the most extreme of the style. For example, here's my, um, number one here. Now, I, I think we can borrow from movies and TV shows. I'm certainly a big enough TV watcher as I'm hypocritically talking about all the reading that I'm doing. I'm watching far too much television and movies and uh, probably on the internet far too much. But if you, the, if you want to know about authoritarian style, rent the great Santini. It has it all in there. It's a wonderful movie. Robert Duvall is in that. Now, the problem with that, though, is, oh, well, I'm not Robert Duvall. Uh -huh. I'm not a military man bouncing a basketball off the kid's forehead. I could never be. But you might be 1% in that style. And I've met parents who are a bit over-controlling, who are not Santini, but they're on the continuum. You get that? So each one of these styles, I see a lot of sideways glances going on here. A lot of like sideways glances going on. Like, thankfully, I'm not saying elbow. Yeah, you're like this. No, you're not. So, you know, yeah. No fighting in the car either later. No fighting spouses. In, you know, it's a Sunday afternoon, remember? That kind of thing. Um, I do think that, that I, how many people watch the show Parenthood? It's a wonderful show. It's a wonderful show. You can backtrack on it. And what's wonderful about it is that it does show a lot of different styles of parenting and struggling with issues. And this, uh, I forgot his name, the actor there. Um, this, yeah. Um, he's, he's sort of struggling. He knows he's Santini-like. He sort of knows that he shouldn't be like so cold. But he's fighting his DNA. You know, he's kind of like, you know, he's another generation. And he's really conflicted about it, and he's trying desperately to be sensitive. Okay? But you see his conflict. Betty, I, I, in Mad Men, I mean, if you watch Mad Men, you know, I can't say anything good about her. Um, <laughs> she's just cold and, you know, bottomless pit of, of, of no empathy. But let's leave that out of it. I, I, I just think, what's the downside of this style that you think? What do you think? If you approach, now again, please don't take it as, well, Selznick's saying I shouldn't have rules. Or so, he's not, that's not the message. But what is it about, especially the farther away you go down this continuum to certainly out to Santini land or to the parent of them? What's the downside, do you think? So? Mutiny on the bounty. I wrote down here Captain Bly. The deckhands want to basically stick it to you. They want to, they're going to do it quietly and covertly, but they're going to say, go, I know it's on video, F yourself. That's basically what the downside is of this. The couple of times, because I don't believe that I had it in me to do this as the man of the house, but the couple of times when we sat our son down and kind of had these discussions, and I thought, okay, and I'm going in with the game plan, you know, in my head, 
and thought about, and I sensed in the middle of the conversation, that had I said to you, well, we're taking away your Xbox and that's it, all I would have gotten was, well, yeah, well, F you, you're an a-hole, quietly. It would not have been under, you know, down in the basement, or I'll show them that that's not going to work. And I wonder, I'm not, I wonder what lesson comes of that. I just wonder. To me, what you get is anger, you get rage. Depending on how, how much of a child you have over the kid. Um, I think that there are kids, who, and they don't necessarily show it. That's one of the problems. It's sort of like, okay, you know, passive aggressive, like the deckhands. Oh, so we, we'll, we'll cut the cord today. We're going to cut the rope so Captain Bly's boat is not going to really go the way it should, but he won't know that we really cut the rope. Mm, there's going to be a little mutiny on the ship in a very covert kind of way. God bless. Anybody else want to comment? Not one comment from that one? Really? Anybody? Um, Find it. You know, it's an interesting question, and, I, and one of the things about this trait, my, we get nostalgic for this one, because this is very 1950s, 1960s, and, my, and there's certain cultures still, I present this, and I don't want to get too socioeconomic, but I, let's, if, I, if I present this to certain groups, they think this is the one that we should be doing with kids. And there are times when my secretary, you know, people will walk out of my office, and she'll come to me and say, don't you think we should just smack them? Shouldn't we just hit them? Like, isn't it just that? Like, we get nostalgic for this, so there is a certain pass down. We, we learn our parenting styles from our parents. We can't help that. We're struggling with our own parental tapes. That's a huge issue. So if our fathers, the male side of this is more the, the, the authoritarian, although the women can get tough with this too, are, are certainly the ones that you're, you're probably learning this from or rebelling against in your head. I'm not going to... I'm not going to be like my dad. He was really tough. I'm going to go the other way. I think you said earlier that you need to have a little bit of every style because there may be occasions where you need to draw from the authoritarian. It's, it shouldn't be your predominant style because you're right, your child will rebel. But I'll tell you, um, I could see on the basketball court my daughter was chewing gum and she was in the middle of a game and I for one, think that's dangerous. Oh, you didn't walk out of the court, did you? I absolutely did at halftime. Oh, I didn't halftime. do it. <laughs> all right, all right. Not in the middle of the game. I absolutely <laughs> did walk over to her, and, you know, right, right. there was no discussion. There was no... Right. We I, can... I used to have those walkovers to the, to the, uh, <laughs> uh, the dugout. Watch the game, Daniel. But I you know? think there are certain times that we, that we have to pull from that piece. Sure. Because this is safety, you know. You know, this is safety. It, it, it's a, it's a wonderful point. I think that w what's the wisdom in each of these things? And again, balance and, and you know, so yeah, I, I think rules, establishing rules, you know, that's probably a little more on the authority side. That's why you want to think about this as 1%. Where am I on this continuum? And that's why I think if you have a spouse, if you're not a single parent, you can do a kind of check. How am I doing? Am I too tough on the kid on this? All right, well, yeah, I think you might, you know, that kind of back and forth. File two. Um, anybody watch Weeds? Right, don't you think this, this lady, as much as she's selling pot, that was the original premise, to keep food on the table, you know, she's selling pot to kind of keep her family together, right? I think she's out to lunch. I think she's a horrible parent. And I might be wrong about this, but I think that she's kind of a, a, a parent who's a little too, like, you know, all hell breaking loose in the house, you know, this style, though, again, most of us, oh, I would never be uninvolved. I'd never. However, sometimes you might be. Remember in the show, the movie Parent, Parenthood, I think that was the original one, the, the mom had a great line. Well, the first kid, you know, we, we, we watch this. The second kid, third kid, he's playing with knives. We don't even realize it. You know, the third kid comes along, you forget. All right, he's got knives. So, you know, you, I remember when I was growing up, my best friend, Alan, First kid, everybody's watching closely. Second, third kid, we as children would watch who's Scotty is three or four wandering the streets. What? Who's minding the store? You lose a little bit of, you know, as the, so they're a little bit more uninvolvement also single parents. 
you know, if you're working hard and you're at the hospital all day long and you're a nurse and you're doing whatever, and you're, you know, you're just glad that your kid is home watching television and you're exhausted. So single parenting, like this lady, does have a lot of challenges. While it's sounding hard on her, she has tremendous challenges. But the uninvolved parenting style, as you could imagine, a lot of, a lot of issues come about. Also with depressed parents. A lot of depressed parents are, uh, whatever. Yeah. Correct? Anybody want to comment on this one? Move to the fun one, my favorite. These are the ones I love. This is our world. Come on now. Here we go. As long as the kids are happy, as long as they're not frustrated, as long as you, you know, if the kid, if your friend's son, I mean, if your, if your son's friend got an Xbox system or your your daughter's friend is now on Facebook, then I got to rush in and make happy day one because, God forbid, your kid is day one, not on Xbox. We saw that all the time. We saw that all the time, that, that there would be this parents that were rushing in to make their kid have the best stuff. I'd like to believe that we didn't do some of this. I mean, we see it with cars. You know, everybody buying the brand new car, day one. I mean, Gail and I are very proud of the fact that our kids to date, 20 years old and 23 years, are still sharing a used Saturn and haven't thought about it. So that's, you know, it's like, okay, they didn't need a brand new car. But other generations say, well, who's paying the insurance? Suckers. If you're a parent who practices that on occasion, does it, and you pick, which occasions carefully, doesn't that help you when it's time to be the authoritative one? And so for me, when I imposed, my husband and I imposed the Xbox restriction, it was, our son accepted it because there are times where we say, sure, that's not a battle we're going to fight. That's fine. You want it, whatever. Uh, and and it, I hope it's not inconsistent to him. It doesn't seem to be. But I think that if you mix some of the styles that you're talking about, not the uninvolved necessarily, but at least this one. If, you know, my son might say, you know, Mom, it's Thursday night, I, I, I read all week, I, I just, I don't want to read tonight, I want to, that's fine, honey, you know, that's yeah, well, fine. Yeah, it goes back to what we said before, you know, I mean, it goes back to like, there's wisdom in all, in, in all of it, you know, um, there's, there's a piece of wisdom in, in, in everything. I'm sensing a little, um, you know, I don't want to keep people. I want to make sure that we're, we're on time. I don't know, what, what time is it? I'm losing, I didn't keep, I will watch a cell phone with me. Five, three, all right. So we'll go, we'll go a little bit, 15 more minutes or so, just to kind of, I don't want to keep people. I know it's Sunday afternoon, but, you know. Uh, no, look, I think there's wisdom in a lot of this. I think that we can't get a, we're, we're a pleasing generation. We want to keep our kids happy. We're worried about their self-esteem. And we believe I'm not saying rightfully so. We believe that a lot of this self-esteem is in buying them things, getting one of the... The answer is in the, is in the last style. The answer is in being true to yourself. When, when our daughter was young and fourth grade, I tell the story a lot, you know, it was the, you know, all the kids were seeing Titanic. And we didn't feel it was appropriate for her. Same idea about Facebook. We didn't feel, you know, whatever, you know, Josh brought up earlier. And it was not easy to have our daughter sobbing that she was the only kid among her peers who was not seeing Titanic. For you remember, it might seem like now what's the big deal, but there were a lot of dead bodies in the water and there was a steamy sex scene. And, you know, it was not a nine-year-old movie. However, because of society being what it is, ah, they're all seeing it. So you have to make tough decisions, which goes back to the non-pleasing stuff. Now, the next style, this is a spin-off style. A lot of the moms can relate to it. You know, the, uh, the kind of, like, frazzled, you know, can't get it together parent. They're swirling into the preschools. They're going out, and they're, you know, dropping the kids off. And, you know, I think the kids smell blood on this one. I think the kids are sensing, like, oh, good, I can go in for the kill now. Mom's really out to lunch. I, you know, she's just so frazzled, I can do what I want. Next one, this is actually my favorite of them all. And this is another spin-off of the pleasers. 
And, I, and, I, and actually, the, this one here, the one in the upper right, is, is part of the, uh, that one doesn't belong in there exactly. Uh, that, that's the tyrant child who's, who's, that goes back to the pleaser one, okay? You see the parents waiting on the child. <laughs> you know, I, I had a parent a while ago, I don't I hope you're not in the room, <laughs> who told me that they used to bring down, I, I'm not joking, I'm not, on a pillow. The kid was watching television. On a pillow, she'd bring down the toothpaste and the toothbrush and bring it down to the kid because the kid refused to go break it, break stride, and he watch he would watch his morning show, and the mom's theory was rather than get him upset, he'll brush his teeth downstairs while watching. Tell I should probably brush it for him. I don't know. I guess, you know, a little scary, I think, but I don't know. That's that one. But the other ones, oh, we are hovering in this society. We are the hoverers, aren't we? We hover, and we hover, and we hover, and we, we're all overseeing. But I also like the notion of the curling parents. Curling parents are smoothing the you know, if you saw If you saw the Winter Olympics, you know their job, the sweepers, are to make sure there is not a little, little tiny speck of ice that may get that puck slightly off track. Well, pa curling parents are the same idea. Oh, we got to smooth, make everything nice. Where did we get this notion from? We're, we're out of our minds. I mean, there's not supposed to be a bump in the road. And the same thing with this lawnmower parent. These are the ones that are calling colleges. Steve's not. He's calling colleges to say, oh, my son or daughter is not doing well in your anthropology class. And, you know, the professor is giving her a heart. Calling college? Huh? The lawnmower parent is making life like a, a, a green, you know, like, like everything's like a, a, a green, you know, like a, a putting green. Smooth. Or pool. What's that? Calling employers. Right. Oh, my God. Calling employers. Isn't that crazy? I need to leave in a minute, but my, my two kids, and you know them well, are so different. And... I'm sure, without thinking about it, we've engaged one style for my daughter and a completely different style for my son, and I'm sure they've seen that we change gears to handle the other child. I'm not sure if that has an effect on them or whether one wishes they had it the other way or one's glad they have it the way we're giving it to them, but, you know, I don't know, well, I never even thought of it before. But knowing, yeah, knowing both of your kids, um, and, you know, we had the same sort of dynamic in a sense because one was, you know, there's always going to be, I think, with multiple kids, the easygoing temperament that I jo used to joke that my daughter could be, I, I used to be very proud early on. It was because I was a child psychologist and I had all these theories and my wife and I were talking together and that's why Julia was kind of like becoming, you know, and then, you know, the, the, but I realized later on she could have been parented by a tree, that she just kind of raised, she just, you know, easy temperament. Whereas child, you know, kids with more difficult temperaments require a different handling. This brings us to the last style. And here's, this is where it all, all roads come back now to your answers about Facebook. And I do think that the, the wisdom and the research and, and is tied in this. You know, this goes back to the, the ship imagery. They're gonna, they're, you know, Probably another generation ago, probably, although I would imagine something like a Leave it to Beaver parent style is probably not that different than this. You know, that kind of like reasonable talk. So it's reasonable but clear. It leads. It knows the direction you want it to go, but it's open to other ideas. They're more matter-of-fact tones. It's less shrill. We, as a society, kind of believe that the number one parenting tool is what? yelling, screaming. And how many times has a kid said to you, thanks, Ma, thanks, Dad, I really got it. Thanks for yelling at me. I, I'll, I'll, I'll do my homework. But we do it, and we persist in it, even though it doesn't work. Um, I call This style, I'm going to run through just a couple of points in this style, then we'll open up to some comments. I see this as having... I, lo I love this line, I applied it to when, we, when my kids were a little younger, having a series of values clarification discussions. 
I used to say, okay, Daniel, we're about ready to have our, another in a series of values clarification discussions. Gee, don't you think you're texting a little too much? Gee, let's talk about it. Let's sit down and talk about the rules. Go, you know, let's, let's clarify a little bit. Um, if you get clear with this style, you realize how much of this Facebook, cell phone, driver's license, car, internet use, all of it is a privilege. It's a privilege. It's not they breathe in Cherry Hill, they get a brand new car. It's not Facebook, you breathe and 14 and voila, the magic day, you can go on Facebook. Have you established a good track record? Like I tell parents all the time, the time to start learning to get your car, or I tell kids to kids too, to get your car privileges is like now at 11 and 12. You want to drive, I, I say to the boys, you want to learn how to drive a car? Well, start getting some money in your bank, not cash money. Start putting some money in the bank that says when the parent can trust you and say, you know what? You do exercise good judgment in spite of the fact that you're kind of young and your frontal lobes are still a little bit on the shaky side. You've done a pretty good job, kid. So go on Facebook. I'll monitor it once in a while. I'll check in on it. But I trust you. You're going to get a cell phone. But here are some rules. Here are some guidelines. I'm going to check on it. And if you break the rules, I'm not going to punish you. But you kind of, you know, I don't see it as a punishment. To me, it's a natural consequence, a natural outgrowth that says, you know what, for a while, you're just not, you're not mature enough now for Facebook. We'll get back to you in six months. I'm sorry you lost it, but for six months. To me, it's not a punishment. It's a natural outgrowth given in an authoritative kind of way. You know, the clearer you get on this notion of privilege, the clearer you get and understand what that means, then it drives everything. And you can substitute the content, whether it's Facebook, Internet, car driving, going to a party, going to whatever, it's all the same content. Last point about this, and this to me is the most important one. I think I sort of alluded to it before, then we'll open it up to a couple of comments. I think that above all of it, it's not Rich Selznick's point, it's not a child psychologist's point, it's not your mother's. You and your spouse or you as an individual have to get clear on your own value system. We live in a, you know, my upper middle class world here, Cherry Hill, and everybody's doing, well, if your value system is buy the kid a brand new car without him having really earned his stripes, then go ahead and do it. If your value system says at nine years old, Facebook is okay, Rich Selznick may not agree, but that's your value system. And you have to be comfortable with your value system. That, to me, is the biggest point. If you're comfortable, don't really listen to yourself and say, you know what, I'm uncomfortable with this right now, just like the Titanic story. We were uncomfortable, we listened to it, and you set it. we set our boundaries. But if you're going against your value system just because you're going to be a pleaser parent to keep the kid happy, then, you know, things are going to pop, you know? I think that the style, as it says here, applies to almost all content of all problems, meaning it's not Facebook or cell phone, or it's just substitute content. You know, yes, there are new challenges, you know, they are scary seeing photos up, but to, to another generation, 1915, that pool table was scary. You know, and remember the Plato stuff, and I do think that there is a certain amount of timelessness to this. Um, I do think that a lot of it is as David Byrne said, same as it ever was. Um, and that's kind of my message of today. And, you know, I, I would welcome, you know, I do have, I welcome comments. I do have here, which I, I didn't want to get into a laundry list today of, uh, you know, the things to do on the Internet. But this is a helpful article, this, this one by, by, I think she's very good, this Michelle Borba, Dr. Borba. You know, Read through it. This will give you some ideas. Uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there. A friend of mine says he has his cell phone. His, ki his kids are still young, 10 years old. And he, he ins the rule of the house is that the phone gets charged in the parents' room every night. 
with the idea being it's not going to be buzzing, you don't have access to it at night, there are kids having trouble with sleep problems. So the earlier you start with not rigid rules, but establishing guideline rules, we had in our life, in our, in our family, the kids' rooms were pretty boring. <laughs> I joked that the kids' rooms didn't have much happening in them. My, my dad wanted to buy them televisions and stuff in their room. We said, no, no. They're down, everything's downstairs. The computer, there was, at that time, was more family computer. There was less lap, was downstairs. Having things more visible, not doing a homework up in the room, you know, things like that, I think, are the tips that come out of authoritative parenting. Where you say, look, you can't go do, you can't be doing that up in your room now. I don't want you, your internet usage is down in the family room. That's the way it is. You might not like it, but that's the way it is. Okay? I'm not watching your every move, but this is where it is. When it's more public, they're less likely to go into places that they shouldn't. And there are plenty of places on the internet where you shouldn't be. And they know how to dump the catch, as we said. <laughs> so, you know, follow these things, use some wisdom for yourself, use common sense as a guideline, and you'll be all right. And they grow up, and they, uh, you know, that's the other part. Last point. Been in it long enough to see kids who, I, I ran into a mom recently. This kid was a horror show when I was seeing him. I mean, he was just out of control making everybody's lives miserable. And she goes, oh, Charlie's doing just great. He's doing wonderful. I'm like, really? How'd that happen? What I see for most of the cases and most of the people I've met in the community is that kids do fine. You know, they grow up and they become adults. They become <laughs> miserable. They move into adulthood with the same anxieties. and what, You know, so they get a long-term view and you'll be okay. Last-minute questions, comments, reactions, Ed? Um, particularly when you were talking about the indulgent, but I think it applies to a couple of these, it reminds me of a couple that we knew who had growing up been extremely uh, poor and be got to a more of a middle class kind of a lifestyle. And as they raised their kids, they became incredibly indulgent on them, trying to give them what they had never had. Right. And as I watched this, and this is before we had children, and I, it, it dawned on me that they weren't necessarily being terribly nice to their kids or terribly not. They were simply just setting a bar. And I think a lot of what you were talking about really resonated as I was thinking about that. Was, this is an expectation level, like having the computer downstairs so that that's where the kids do all their work or having the television mm -hmm. only downstairs. So it's, you're not being good, bad, or indifferent. You're mm -hmm. setting an expectation. You're setting a bar, and that becomes their standard in effect Correct. as well as your own. Correct. And I think that I think that if you think of yourself a bit as a captain of the ship, you know, I do think that, and not a captain Bly, and I think that it's, you know, yeah. I hate to be sexist more often than captains or men, but I think it applies to male and female. Set your expectations. Yes. It doesn't have to be rigid, but be clear. Clarity of communication. This is where we're going today. Know where you want the ship to go, you know, kind of thing. And I think that helps a lot. Yeah. Good. Study, study. Other questions? Did we answer your questions? Did we get, did we get to it, Lisa? But I'll, I'll, if my daughter's not listening to me, at some point I'll just go, you know, I'm not going to scream. I'm just not going to listen to her. And I wonder, it seems to make a little bit of a difference in the meantime, but what is that class? I love it. As? I love it. I always, it makes a point to me, a lot quicker. rather than put the kid in timeout, mm -hmm. I go offline. I get you to go offline. It's like, you know what? I'm kind of done right now, and I don't, I'm too upset to speak. Kid can't argue with that. I'm really, I'm upset. I'm going to go in the other room right now. When I'm, when I'm feeling better, I'll talk to you again. Ooh, mommy is upset. No one likes that. But if you had done a you this and you that, then you get defensiveness. Mm -hmm. Now you're going to get a little bit of, uh-oh. She sees I how it feels because yeah. they said so I love it. I think that comes right out of authoritative, boundary-setting style. But without the yelling. I heard the yelling yeah. growing up, so I, I try, to, try to make an effort to do a that, little less. That's how I would see And it, it seems to make a quicker impact because kids are so self-focused, and it kind of snaps Well, the impact is like, really, whoa, no, yeah. look. I, how come you know how to do this with your husbands? <laughs> you know, but you don't know how to do it with the kids. You know, you know how to make them feel guilty and grovel. Well, do the same with the kids. You know, it's like, whoa, I better get in mom's good graces. She's pretty upset. But it doesn't have to be raging upset. It doesn't have to be hot anger. It's kind of cool yeah. anger. Yeah. We, you know, we got away from that because of 
feelings of guilt. Well, let him feel a little guilty. It's okay. It bothers me for a little bit, but yeah, I see how right. quickly you know, he makes okay. the point They'll live. quietly. Let him work on therapy years later. <laughs> To use an authoritative style with, let's say, Facebook, um, being able to establish rules and expectations, my concern is really the amount of energy and time that I have to monitor, like to enforce those rules. Um, yeah. And so that's, to be honest, that's a lot of why I've held back right. I still won't, because I, I don't have the energy to make, sh to, to set the limit yeah. and say it's this amount of time Look, and I have to be able to check. And yeah, I, you know. I, I've gone on, you know, because at some point you can't. My, I'm friends with my I've almost never been on his site, almost never. Mm -hmm. But now he's older, I understand. And I agree with you that the amount of energy that it would take and time to truly monitor this is mind-boggling, okay? Mm -hmm. Think about this. The, you know, kids, kids collect friends like it's baseball cards we used to do, you know? Like, okay, I got a stack of cards. I got 800 friends. You're going to go on 800 different sites and check who these people, you know, you can't. You'd be here for the next three weeks, four <laughs> weeks. You can't do it. But, so you have to be in continually with these values clarification discussions. Once in a while monitoring, once in a while checking in, I believe, and not being out to lunch, not being uh, the style is completely, oh, whatever you want to do is fine. Right. But Say, look, I looked at your site today. I appreciate it. But boy, that's some scary stuff. I know that. You, you know, it's your friend doing it, but I'm a little uncomfortable with this. Right. We need to talk about this and why I'm uncomfortable. I, I don't see any other way, right. I, honestly. Now, 11, they're a little young. I really, no. Josh's question before. I'm at 13 and a half. Oh, 13, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, it's going to, again, Cherry Hill is going to be, you know, yeah, they're, the they're going to be like, you know, a lot of those kids are going to be the front end of the curve with okay. Facebook, yep. and, and it's a badge of honor for a bunch mm -hmm. of them. That's the new badge of honor. Right. So I, I'd be very concerned about it, right. set what you think right. is the right age. I, I think that it becomes, four, I don't know, 14, 15 is about as an age where you can have a good discussion with them. Mm -hmm. but. My experience with Facebook and a lot of my kids' friends, they're in middle school and high school, is you put in your time at the beginning and it gets a lot less after if they know that you have their password and they know that any, at any time you can check in, you generally get kids who, who follow the, your rules. I think that's a good, I, I think that's very well said. It, I think that, that that's correct. And, and if you happen to catch something, you know, I brought my, I remember the very first time my daughter was on Facebook and you could send your friends postcards and she had a postcard that was sent to her that showed up on her page and it was a, pass, a picture of a pacifier, but instead of the little plastic piece, it was a male sex organ. And I just called her over and I said, hey, man, I noticed you had something on your Facebook. What do you think of it? And she said, oh, mom, I, I know it was sent to me. I said, well, what do you, how do you think it portrays you? And she said, I don't think I like the way it portrays me. I said, all right. I walked away. I didn't tell her to get it off. Mm -hmm. I didn't. But the next time that I went on, it was gone. Yeah. And that was the last time that I ever had to do, make any changes or suggest any changes for her, and we had a similar incident with my son. So I think if you have their password and they know every once in a while you can check in and you don't immediately say, get off, that's it, you're done, I, I think if you discuss it and make it their decision, it seems to keep them on the straight and narrow. Yeah, I would I endorse that 100%. I think that's correct. I think you can't you get into over-controlling, you get a lot of anger. It's a part of their reality, it's a part of their world, as I said earlier, or my earlier about the, it's their social life, it's their medium. So, gang, I appreciate you coming out on a Sunday afternoon. I hope we got to, you know, answer the questions. I hope, you know, um, that we covered the territory. So, thanks a lot, and, and for, for those repeat, you know, people that have heard me before, thanks for coming out again, so thank you very much. We hope you enjoyed this program from the Samost Jewish Family and Children's Service of Southern New Jersey. For more information, visit jfcssnj.org. We produce these programs in the studios of Professional Podcasts in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, on the web at professionalpodcasts.com. For everyone at JFCS, this is Steve Lubetkin. 
Thank you for joining us and take good care.